Hi, everybody. Welcome to this week's episode of Pensado's Place. I'm here in some really bright yellow. Uh, you're going to meet in just a second the incredible Lauren Daigle, um, along with Uber producer Mike Elizondo. Um, she just got nominated for two Grammys. One of the most, Dave and I agree, one of the most compelling talents we've ever met, and we just love our conversation. We think you will, too. Quick reminder, get to NAM January 25 through 27. Uh, our first night there on Thursday. Ooh, can't tell you who it's going to be yet, but superstars. Tw uh, on Friday, we're going to do a panel on spatial audio and teach you how you can do those kinds of mixes, understand Atmos, mix for your headphones, all that kind of stuff. And on Saturday, two super DJs, which we'll announce shortly, and we're going to talk about sampling and, and Serato and all the things that have moved the DJ world forward. So good stuff coming. Without further ado... Uh, hope you enjoyed this as much as we do. The just nominated Lauren Daigle and Michael Elizondo. Hi, guys. What's up? Thanks what's for having us. What's, what's up, everybody? There's, there's so many different places to go. Lauren, one of the things that I think is fascinating about your career is I think sometimes, and this has happened in some of our guests in the past, people don't understand that in order to be true to your faith, but also to be commercial mm -hmm. and to also try to break new ground. And you're doing some innovative things that we will get to. That's more than just a notion that that's not, let's make a record and put it out and let's, it'll be fine. Correct. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. How have you, how have you approached your journey? I think one of the key factors when you have like a mission, especially when it comes to art, uh, cause it's so personal is to make sure that you surround yourself with people that understand the vision. I think that's like paramount. And some of the writers that we've had on this latest project have absolutely blown my mind in the way that they have been able to carry it. Natalie Hemby being one of them, Amy Wodge being one of them, Michael Lozando being one of them. Uh. It's been, it, I, I would say that having people that can understand and also push you deeper into the places that you want to go. You know, they can challenge you. They can present opportunities to you. They can um, open like your bandwidth even and say, Hey, what about this idea? Or what, how about this? Knowing where the destination, what, what the goal of the destination is. And I think whenever it comes to art, you have to be really mindful of the people who you bring in on that experience and regarding faith as well what's different between this album and this and the last album the second album oh well i feel like i went to mike at the very beginning um and we were chatting and he said what do you want this record to sound like and i just remember saying i really want it i don't want it to sound like a soul record like a pop record like a if it's gonna if it's gonna be a song that embodies a sound like that i want it to be the sound i want it to be authentic i want it to be pure and he was someone who really carried that vision mike you did such an incredible job i say it every time he carried that vision to pass and i would say one of the one of the key factors to me from this record to the last record um was we went to new orleans together and there is something that experience i i I'm mm -hmm. from Louisiana. I grew up with those sounds, with brass instruments just like blaring in my ears at all times. And uh, the soul down there, the spirit down there, the energy down there is very different than some of the commercialized places that I have found myself in the creative journey, right? Mm -hmm. And so to have Mike and the team come down there and get to live in that space for a bit, I feel like was something different than anything I'd been a part of thus far in the record making process what was fascinating about that to me i mean the michael elizondo that we know has always been this kind of guy that stood in the intersection mm -hmm. and it didn't matter what cars were coming through he knew how to direct the traffic on all of them and and candidly as the brother on the on the zoom there's always been a soulful kind of black element in what mike does but he's able to process it in a way that it doesn't, it feels that way, but it doesn't scream that way. 
right? And so when I heard you, when I listened to your music, I was like, ooh, this is soulful personified. Like, yeah. so between Mike Elizondo and New Orleans, I other than eating some gumbo together, I <laughs> that, that's kind of the perfect place to be inspired, the perfect union, the right? Those, those all, all those elements seem to work together. Oh, yeah. I mean, Mike, you can tell the story, but when we were down there on that street corner, I've, I've talked about it so many times, but it's because it was the first time, one of the first times for me that my music journey intersected, talk about the intersections, right? It was the first time the music journey intersected with my personal life mm. and the heritage at which I had come from. It was the first time that that sound was able to live on a record for me. And so, Mike, we were down there uh, and there was this street corner. Mike, you want to tell the story? Yeah, it was, it was actually, it felt like Lauren had planned this whole thing and <laughs> set it up. Like I was, I couldn't believe this was happening, but it was my first significant trip to New Orleans and, and uh, Lauren had invited me and Jason Ingram and, and uh, Natalie Hemby to come out and do some writing, you know, we were, we, we kind of had a temp, a time, uh, you know, to start making the record, but this was like, let's just go to New Orleans. You guys got to see where I live and where I come from. And, and on the first day that we're there, we, we leave Lauren's house and we, we start to walk to her, towards a, a place she was going to take us out to dinner. And on the way there, um, there's a little bit of mist of rain starting to happen. Um, but it was gorgeous out. And, and as you see in the movies or whatever, there was this an incredible street brass band playing um on a corner just jamming you know when the saints go marching in mm -hmm. and uh and and we're we, you know a, a group of us were there just kind of in disbelief at how great it sounded and and where we were and getting experiences and then i remember at one point there was this car it was near an intersection this car rolls up and kind of slows down now, where I come from, when a car slows down, <laughs> there's some, so it's not a good thing. There's some not trouble good. about to go down. So I was kind of a little nervous. Like, you know, I noticed it out of the side of my periphery or whatever, but, but uh, the car slows down and the next thing you know, the window rolls down and I'm starting to get a little nervous. And the dude pulls out a horn and he starts jamming along to the band on the street corner and everybody erupts and Lauren's out there dancing with the guys in the group. And it, it was surreal and it but it it really um was the beginning of this this trip and this adventure with lauren where where she was letting us in and eventually through this album letting the listener and her fans in to um a deeper side of where she comes from musically and and it really just shed so much light on on what needed to come through on this record and and the energy and the enthusiasm of new orleans and 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 lauren uh it just on every song it didn't matter if it was a ballad or a tempo it needed to paint this this story of where she comes from and and for 20 songs that's that's what we tried to do did you uh did you did you go more cajun or zydeco you know it wasn't anything specific um you know there were some songs where we tried to experiment you know with all different sides of of, of those beats and you know pulling from Groups like, uh, you know, the meters, obviously, and some of their offshoots, like what was it, uh, the wild chupatulas? Is that how you pronounce it? I think. Well, that, um, that Kershaw, maybe. Chapatulas. Cha chapatulas, yeah, I always mess that up. But, you know, and, and trying to get that funkier side of, of, of New, you know, what New Orleans is known for. Um, I wouldn't say that there's anything very traditional in New Orleans, but we just pulled from like the horns and the percussive elements and tried to have on certain songs this sort of undercurrent. Um, but really it's more about the heart and the, and the, the enthusiasm and the colors of New Orleans that I think we tried to make sure were represented in this album. And, and you know, and, and Lauren's voice, you know, oozes it. it it's it's right. all in, right. in all of those textures of her voice. And so we were really just trying to look at all the material we had and look for opportunities to, uh, to pour some of that, that uh, enthusiasm onto it. Now, this is the part of the show where we give a little travel tip. So as your local travel agent, I'm here to tell <laughs> you that when you go to a city like New Orleans or you go to a city like Nashville or you go to Austin, Texas, or you go to those places that are not such big metropolises that the metropolis gets in the way 
and you let the local culture infuse your music making, you will find parts of you that you never knew existed. If you just let it ooze through you, it will come out. And here's what's crazy about the story you told. Back when that back when Dave was no longer hard drive, uh, <laughs> which is an inside joke that the audience doesn't know. Uh, I used to manage a guy named Brian McKnight, and we were struggling. Oh, I was we were struggling on a record, and it, the record was, and we were trying to figure out how to break it. And he had a song called "Anytime," and I went to New Orleans for a business thing. I'm standing on the corner, and all of a sudden the car rolls by, and the window rolls down, and all my instincts about let me get the hell out of here, <laughs> and it rolls down, and "Anytime" is pouring out of their speakers now they didn't know who i was it right. was just some brothers and it was the it was not the typical crowd that would be listening to any time these were kind of young you know hood guys and they were do i ever cross your mind they were singing it like they were a <laughs> choir and wow. i called the label and said we got something something's happening here but it was that musical town letting it flow through them kind of indicator that literally real literally changed the trajectory of his career that wouldn't have happened in la or new york mm -hmm. uh, we're in la and it's no diss to me and dave are there's no diss to la it's just if you have a chance to record music and you can go to one of those towns and let the town get in your spirit you'll be amazed it comes out um and that's the end of the travel log part of our show let's come <laughs> <laughs> So that's incredible, <laughs> right? Yeah, so it's cool. the very same experience. Oh, it um, means something to me, and, and and me too. And and it's why Dave and I, um, one love going to Nashville, and yeah. what we get out of it is amazing. And why we have contemplated moving periodically because it's just something special that something special that happens. And then you've got as a guy who puts on live events and so on and so forth. The way you approach your touring, bow down, hats off. Uh, if I wasn't holding my computer, I would drop it and get on bended knee because the way you think about it, the way you've partnered for those special rooms, t tell us about one, I want to go to a show and get on a beanbag and enjoy <laughs> the experience. <laughs> tell us where that came from and what you, how you envision this. Oh, absolutely. Well, Touring is one of those things where you get to uncover the brain part, I feel like, in a certain way, uh, the brain part of the record. So from that experience, like anytime I went to Mardi Gras as a kid or Cirque du Soleil or any of these like fun, colorful, but whimsical, they kind of always pointed me back to the way that New Orleans felt, right? Uh -huh. But then go into the studio and that's like, you, you write a song and you get to uncover these pieces and these elements as you go in and record things that would blow your mind. I mean, there's moments where I'm looking at Mike, like slapping his shoulder, like, I can't play this sound like this, you know, <laughs> freaking out. So how do I create that experience every single night, that wonder, that curiosity? Um, how do I create that every night in a live show? And I remember uh, being intentional about some of the sonic landscape as well, making sure that that was going to be something that translates live or that that could be impacting live. Um, and so the colors and the oddity and all of that was created in Louisiana. We call it the joie de vie, the joy of living. It was created in the sense of just living. We had this season where, you know, COVID hit. We all were all still for a while. And I, I went home, I stayed in New Orleans and I got lost. And so all of those colors and the sentiments and the curiosity, I wanted to be a, something that lands in the room. Um, and I also remember saying, you know, I'm really good at making people cry. I, I'm, I can make people cry singing, but I'm tired of making people cry because I'm kind of a cut up. So uh, kind of. I, was, I was like, how am I going to do this for the rest of my career just sit here sing a ballad wave thank <laughs> you you know right. i was like i gotta have some of the energy and uh I, I need some of that brought to stage and so a lot of the songs contributed themselves to that feeling 
live as well, which was really exciting. Um, and then lastly, Culture City, they're incredible. They came alongside, we partnered together and we're building rooms for um, people with sensory needs in every single arena. And the thing that's cool about this is that we go in, we build the room, we, we set it up and everything, but it actually is a permanent room. So when we leave, it doesn't it's leave. It's oh, wow. So Amazing. for every sporting event, for every play, for every concert, whatever goes into that arena, any person with autism, any person with um, any, any sensory issue, epilepsy, whatever, can go in and use that room. It's, it's the coolest thing. Okay, can I ask permission on something really quickly? Mm-hmm. There's, there's a well-known actress named Holly Robinson Pete. Um, she has a major foundation called the Holly Rod Foundation. And if you look at HBO's Real Sports this month, they did a show on her son who was told at three he would never amount to anything. Mm-hmm. And now he's the major clubhouse guy for the Dodgers, and he lives on his own, and he drives and so on and so forth. And they created a series of his name's Rodney Jr. His father was a Heisman Trophy, uh, Heisman Trophy candidate, a pro quarterback. But they devoted their lives to taking on this challenge of autism and also Parkinson's. Um, and they created a series of things. They're creating a series of things called RJ's Room. And in that room, it's similar to what you're describing. And I would love to at least connect you guys yeah. to just see what, what could be there. Um and she has a big profile. The foundation is incredible. And to me, this is what art does. On top of you enjoying the song or crying because of Lauren's voice or Mike's production, we can help people and elevate the game and you utilize this gift that we're all stewards of to do more with. So if you can I do that when we get off camera? Is that 100%. Kind of- I okay. would love it. Okay. That is the, the whole essence of it was those statements right you're never going to amount to anything Mm. i'm like so tired of hearing that we have crossed so Mm. many boundaries and barriers in society with people who would be considered the outcast or the non-normals or whatever Mm -hmm. and i was in australia no i was in new zealand and i was at this show there was um someone who was handicapped there and we were just having a conversation she was passing through she was on her way out of life and going to somewhere else, you know, and she looked at me and she said, we, we can do this different, you know? And I was like, yeah, tell me about it. She was like, well, for live concerts in New Zealand, we started an organization where even if you are bedridden in a hospital, they transport you down. And there's like a section that is sectioned off for people that are bedridden. There's wow. like, I'm in the, on stage and there's people in hospital beds in conjunction with everybody else that's in the crowd. And I was like, wow, these are people, they get it. They understand the healing element of art. They understand Mm -hmm. what it is that we can be doing for people. You look at um, like uh, Alzheimer's. Yes. And when they put music to their ears, like their brain wakes up for the first time in years, right? So I'm like, why, why do we keep sectioning off society where this type of group is allowed to come and it's a normal environment. And then everybody else is having to go through leaps and bounds in order to get into these places that really fill us all up. So I would love to connect with RJ's room because I just, you know, where it all began for me was in New Zealand when I saw the distances that they went to include people. And then, uh, you know, realizing there's so many families with autistic children and it's, it's the uncomfortable element of do we get a babysitter to stay with, you know, one person in our family? Does right. half the family stay back and then half the family? There's always this divisive measure. And I was like, no, let's let's be done with that. Let's figure out ways for the whole family, for everybody to be able to come together. Because music, I mean, it's just, it's so rewarding. There's so much that people can gain and receive in music. Mm-hmm. And I think that it's it's really, yeah, it's important for everybody to be a part. Of experiencing that Woo-wee. <laughs> yeah so there's a lot there to unpack man and, and and it's why i think so many people um gravitate to lauren and her spirit and her heart Question. um obviously her voice and her talent but when you really get to know her and you really get to see all that goes into 
um, you know, how she tries to include and think of everybody. It's, it's pretty inspiring, you know, and, uh, you know, when I, I remember actually going to see her perform with her band out here in Nashville at Bridgestone yep. and just, you know, just seeing the reaction from the audience, um, the interaction between her and her, her fans, um, the arrangements she did with the band, you know, everything that she took to the next level live um, was so inspiring for me, you know, as we prepared to make this record, wanting to make sure she had as many vehicles to like, do whatever she wanted you know just create this whole journey for her um for her audience to go on and uh you know but seeing lauren live is really where you get i think the her the purest sense of who she is as a as an artist i i'm raising our hand for team pensado that we will pay for tickets uh <laughs> whenever no. you're anywhere near uh i gotta go see it and and i and 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 really for our audience, this is something that, that I just want to point out. Um, don't underestimate the power of what you're creating. Like, you know, we want you to have a million likes and subscribes and make a bunch of money and have a hit record and, and all that. But there's so much more to this. Mm -hmm. And and the power of it is incredible. And it also reeks like it took me about an end day about a nanosecond to realize how special Lauren was. And that's just from listening. That's before talking, that's before getting a sense, that's before reading a bio. And as a fellow crier, like I will cry at a Geico commercial. I'm like, oh, I'm a chameleon, oh my God. Don't, don't step on the chameleon. Um, but but we had a we had an award, an Oscar winning sound design person on very early in Pensado's place. And he had won an Oscar for Mad Max 2 for sound design. And I asked him at one point in time, when do you know you're at the apex of your creativity? Mm -hmm. and he said, I took some actor's lessons and I unlocked the part. I now know I'm hitting it right on point when I start crying. He said, but I had to unlock that path into that space. And now it's a tool that I can utilize to know that I'm being my most authentic self. And, and it was just, I, it, I was like, okay, I'm, it's cool that I cry. Okay. Got that part. Like, like, <laughs> like it's cool. So, um, uh, so these kinds of discussions are like Dave and I feel we're the beneficiary of it. The way you think about touring, your voice and what you do, the, the authenticity of your of your hometown coming through you, the challenge of going to new places and never settling, um, the idea of being inclusive to lots of folks and saying, "Wait, wait, there's a problem. Let me come up with a solution." Like yeah. we don't we, we don't stop at this. Like, oh, okay, we can figure out how to go past it. So, so just know, and I'll stop with the monologue that we are here to help support whatever Pensado's place reach is, has, can do. Cause, um, look, you had us at Elizondo. <laughs> <laughs> Cause he's the man, he's the man. Uh, and, and you're the woman. And, and you're the woman. No question. So Lauren, I, 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 don't, I hope I'm not changing the subject, but can you, uh, tell me what spiritual angst is? Oh, wow. Yeah. I think, I think I, well, let me first off say, I actually find myself in a state of spiritual angst very often, which is maybe surprising for most, but uh, I think spiritual angst is the wrestle between what is internal and what is external. When you're in this place of, um, okay, why does something inside of me say one thing, but then something on the outside of me feels something different or expresses something different or receives something different? Mm -hmm. I find myself in that chasm quite often, if you will. So for me, that would be what spiritual angst is, the wrestle between one versus the other, this versus that. That makes sense, and that that, that helps your your music. Do you use that 
opportunity for enhancing your music? I think so. I think there's times where, you know, we can wrestle, okay, what does sorrow look like? What is sor- sorrow for me looks a certain way. What is sorrow for someone else? What does hope look like? Hope looks a certain way for me. What is What could hope look like for someone else? And I use these kind of um, themes, if you will, uh, theological points, if you will, and I try to put it up against as many stories as I've received to where it's not necessarily one story at all times, but it's, oh, I remember that, that little girl told me this about something she was going through in that signing line. Oh, I remember this person sent an email and they were going through a, a totally different experience, but they were receiving it this way, or they were, they were navigating it this way. What is a song that can actually help both sides of the coin? Like, what is something that can actually bring healing or bring peace or bring joy or bring curiosity or, you know, fill in the blank? I think those oftentimes, those are the places. The the human condition is something that is always fascinating to me. Why do people do the things that they do? And why? what are the questions that they're constantly trying to answer with their actions? So, like, I put that in kind of, the context of the room, even if it's something that I start my day with or, or, you know, ask myself upon arriving to a co-write or something like that, those are kind of the things that I'm constantly navigating um, when making music. And then it starts to just become a fluid motion at some point. You start to realize if you're always in this state, someone once talked to me about you know, being a sponge. If you go around life and you're a sponge and you get into the writing room and you squeeze the sponge, there's something that's going to come out from what you've absorbed, you know? And that kind of conduit, you know, sometimes it's a melody, sometimes it's lyrics, whatever. But um, I think writing to the human condition is probably something I'll do forever. And and, and I, I recently met a vocal coach who has a pretty long track record um and she unlocks your vocal ability by addressing what might be in you that has nothing to do with vocals oh yeah that that, you know it could be a challenge it could be drama it could be stress it could be something Mm -hmm. you're carrying and it's fascinating to watch it happen in real life one that you have the ability and she's trained like she's not some sort of junk psychologist that and um to watch somebody go from i had trauma that goes back in my past and then it unlocks what i can do and and that again goes back to this notion of you know how you handle spiritual angst Mm -hmm. or how being being empathetic is so important so that you can receive and then turn around and correlate and then create you, you, you know what i mean and oh yeah and, right and and those sequence of things are stuff that is just the magic of what we get to do it's like you you, you almost can't you almost have to do it you can't even mm-hmm. describe it to people they they just go oh wow you can sing and oh yeah there's a lot more to it man it's, <laughs> it's wild so how i've had it explained to me before just going through seasons of vocal pain and then seasons of like i'm doing the same thing i've always done i don't know why my voice sounds so much better right Mm -hmm. this kind of like both and well um my vocal coach she she works at vanderbilt she's brilliant she told me this she said your vocal cords are the width of paper match sticks Mm. which is like okay she said that's the width of a of a so put a paper match stick in your hand your lungs are the power of a fire extinguisher so take a pipe paper matchstick and then ex- from this distance like that's about as far right from that yeah. distance below that fire extinguisher onto that paper matchstick and see what happens Whoa. the ability the fact that our vocal cords can sustain that intensity of pressure is wild it's like the mechanism is wild but wow. then then take external pressures internal pressures 
fear, confusion, uncertainty, sorrow. Take all the human elements. And what does your body do, right? Your body tenses, you you shallow breathe. Yeah. You can't, like when you're under duress, your body actually doesn't breathe to the capacity that it's meant to. It's very, it's all shallow all. breathing. Yeah. And when you find someone like this vocal coach that you're talking about that can see beyond uh, the mechanism into the spiritual side of like, what is this person carrying? And then how do we push that into the mechanism? It is life altering. That is life altering for a vocalist. There, There's times where I'll be under stress and I'm like, hey, I'm I'm hitting all my resonance cavities. Everything is completely clean, clean and clear. I'm, uh, I'm thinking I'm doing it this way. I don't understand. And she'll say, are you stressed about something? And it'll be, it might be so far deep in the reservoir of thought, like mm-hmm. so far back there. And then the second that we pinpoint it, it's like Boom. everything, because your breath, you can't breathe. You can't inhale and exhale if there is any tension in your vocal cords. That is that is the space that, like when you're choking, your vocal cords are in your trachea. They're not in your esophagus, much to everybody. Everybody right. thinks if I drink water, I'm going to be hydrating my vocal cords. You don't. You, the only way that you hydrate your vocal cords is with steam because they're in your trachea, which is connected to your lungs. Oh, so man. it's wild to think that, you know, if you're shallow breathing and you you're choking, like choking in life, your vocal cords actually close off the amount of breath you're able to inhale and exhale. It's crazy. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm done. I'm, I'm, I, <laughs> it's a master class in here right now. What the hell? <laughs> and, and, and by the way, this vocal coach is moving to Nashville. Come mm. on. Yeah. All right. Uh, Put connect. that next to RJ's room. <laughs> and, and her name is Bova. We'll, we'll hook that up. Have y'all, have y'all seen this post? Oh. It's kind of floating around. Mm-mm. Okay. The music business has become increasingly relentlessly demanding of artists. The pressure to release new content, not a synonym for art, to churn out singles and albums and videos and reels and posts on a prescribed schedule, often utterly out of sync with the artist's internal one, isn't producing more or greater art. It's just increasing the noise and exhausting the artist. As someone who has always needed to let the field lie fallow in between creative bursts, I understand the pressure on young artists, and I hope they will resist. We need better songs, not more of them. We need artists who want to make art that lasts, not content that is digested in the time it took to scroll through your Instagram feed. And this is somebody by the name of Gretchen Peters. Okay. This this has it kept floating around in my head as we were as we were chatting. Because you had said something earlier, uh, or you're like, you, for all the people that are watching this, all the artists out there that are like watching this, it is not about the million likes and subscribers. About there's something so much deeper. That paragraph right there, and your statement is what New Orleans built back into me. If that makes sense, like. Wow. It's what I had to like leave Nashville for a season and say this. I'm, I forgot what it's like to create without like always thinking about end goal agenda. Oh, wait, we have, what's the timeline? Oh, like just the frenzy of it all, right? Okay, we've got it. Th- these many social posts we have to do, this many album signings we have to do, all of that stuff, right? And I think for me, when I go to New Orleans, the reason why I, it's like this thing I can't wait to show other people is it's the untouched place. Yeah. It's the place that like people create. I mean, if you come to Mardi Gras and you see the elaborate, the amount of creativity poured into one outfit that some random person just was weaving in their house for the last six months that they're going to wear one day for yeah. one parade. Yep. <laughs> not to be on Instagram, not to be famous, not, but for the sheer love of making art, yes. not for a brand deal, not for, it's yes. like that, that thing is what got rebirthed into my veins by having to take some time away from Nashville, going 
going back to New Orleans and seeing seeing what I came from again. Oh yeah, that's that thing. So I think like even Mike, like you being down there and and recognizing what is the aliveness of this city. That's what it that's what it is. It's like all of the other stuff that constantly pushes in gets to be actually second priority. Yeah. And the art gets to be first priority. That's what New Orleans is for me. And and, and I and I will say this because I've learned this personally. Um there are times where we're tasked and particularly spiritual people with carrying a certain charge forward that it's not put on everybody it's put on a few people and it's generally put on the right people <clears throat> and when you have it or you've been gifted it it's important to at least know that you have it and then do the right thing with it and please take this from an absolute admirer your voice and mike's voice are really important to carry forward and to be the, at the bulwark of what you just described, the way you do your art, the prioritization of it, what can happen with it. Um, Lauren Daigle's around for a reason that goes beyond Lauren Daigle's voice. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and take that and carry it forward and be proud. What little part I have, I, I have learned over the last year or two, lean into it. Don't. It's nice to hear all the nice stuff, but I have a responsibility that um, mm. I, I, I'm I'm leaning into, and and because we're stewards of this, you know. So there's one thing about how it benefits us economically and how we live and so on, so, but we're stewards of this crazy art form, and we've been gifted it to 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 just because you only caretake it for a while, then you pass it on to the next folks, mm -hmm. you know. So you got yeah. You got to do with it what you can now <laughs> and now. then try to mm -hmm. try to make sure it's being put in not only being put in good hands but kept away from bad hands you yeah know, protect it yeah protect it yeah right yeah exactly the person so. i was talking to about about this said they didn't even know i was doing this interview or anything but they said mike elizondo is the person who i would put his name next to that because he was saying the, the person I was talking to was saying that art always presents opportunity versus these forced opportunities that are like coming through this whole social media wave. Yeah. If it's good art and if it is pure art and if it is art that will stand the test of time, the opportunity will come for itself. It's not something you have to go and make happen. And he talked about you, Mike. He said, wow. look at the longevity of this person's career and the the things that he's had his fingerprints on, it's pretty profound. And it isn't yeah. because he's sitting there making 900 social media posts. Right. It's because yeah. he's diligent at the craft. And, yeah. and Well, I'm, yeah, I think, what, you know, all we're trying to do is pay it back, you know, all the inspiration that I received over the years and all the amazing artists and music and art and things that, that are poured into me. And, and if I can somehow be a part of, you know, giving that back to a, a listener or giving that back to a future producer or songwriter or musician, um, then that, you know, that full circle thing that we all share is what is what's the most important to me. Man, look. So, we well, listen, I, I had, I had so, before we even made this record with Lauren, you know, Lauren and I would be on the phone, I kid you not, two to three hours sometimes. Yeah. Oh, just I see. talking, just talking about everything. And I loved it. And it was, it was so inside. I would hang up the phone. And go, man. We we talked a little bit about the record, but we talked about so much more and <laughs> yeah. so much more about the goals. But but it, it's what poured into what this record needed to be, you know. But uh, yeah, you, we you know, Lauren Lauren's, uh, you know, she's one of a kind. And True. and I'll just say I'll just say that I've always dreamt. You know, it's like I, I look at these records that have inspired me from the '50s, '60s, '70s, or whatever. It's like, oh man, if I was I was around when, so when, when, you know, Aretha was making that one, I wonder if I would have been given a shot to make one of her records and blah, blah, blah. But then, you know, I meet it, I meet Lauren Daigle and I realized, no, I was supposed to be around now to get the opportunity to say that I got to work with Lauren Daigle Absolutely. and, wow. and, and this record really, this experience of making this, this music with Lauren 
really um, affected me in that way and really um, inspired me to go, nope, I'm exactly where I'm supposed to be when I'm supposed to be. We, we want another 21 Pilots record. Can you help me? <laughs> yeah, hey, well, you know, we'll see what happens. I, I'll, uh, I'll, I won't say no if they, uh, if they come calling. Yeah, so, so I have a question. How do you warm up and do one? Okay, how do I warm up and do one? You want me to do one? Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. This, is, this is actually not a joke. So, so I was going through a season of, of uh, I lost my vo voice on tour. And I was going through this season of fear of getting back on the road. Yeah. I'd never experienced anything like that. It was really difficult uh to push through these shows and it was like to a, a pretty large scale well this is what my vocal coach did she's like scientist brain right she's a vanderbilt yeah. doctor she says this is what you're going to do you're going to put your your voice in the most compromised position and you're going to teach your brain that even under the most duress you can place your vocal cords in you still are able to breathe. You're still able to get sound. So what you do is you take liquid. This is tea, but what we're going to do is green tea, but water essentially. Okay. And you gargle water while singing. Now, the only way to not yeah. choke is to, to present enough breath. If yeah. you don't present enough breath while your cords are under duress, you're going to choke on the liquid, right? Yeah. So it's like this. Try to gargle? I'm a, yeah, you're, you're, I want you to try this after. Okay. <laughs> See if you can do it too. Good. This is more wow. than I'm sure. This is what wow. at the opera. That's amazing. <laughs> okay. That's so. The key is do it. I, I, oh, for sure. <laughs> oh, yeah. You can't. You can't. Uh, as long, you know, give her a challenge. She will. No, yeah, hundred percent come through. Absolutely. That is. That is literally what I walk around doing. Mike's probably heard that a million times mm. in the studio. But yeah. what it does is it raises your soft palate. You have to keep <clears> your tongue relaxed, and you. The only way to not choke is to breathe. So cool. it really puts everything into perspective. But you're also putting a lot of like intensity by adding the water because you're you're basically right next to choking at all times and mike hmm. uh, do you gargle <laughs> uh just right before i go to bed and <laughs> that's probably the only time you'll catch me gargling and yeah I, and and even then i still have the the uh the, the possibility of choking so um, i was gonna yeah. say this <laughs> this is warm up this is warm up or die that batter's box coming up so. if, if you don't do it right you're gonna fall you know what but it's also so amazing look we we've all been doing this for a long time first time i've ever heard that mm. from, but first time that i heard your vocal cords are in your trachea and not in your esophagus like mm. just just the discovery is whoa uh, uh um now i gotta go to a Lord, i'll buy tickets for people who took up the board <laughs> show and then i'll be you're in, are you in la yeah but i'll go wherever it is huh. and i'll be obnoxious because while you're singing i'll be saying well this is how she warmed up and you see if you mm -hmm. go on stage she's doing this and then you can go into this room and you can have the sensory thing wow <laughs> this, this is really amazing um dave you got a batter's box teed up I do. I do i've got a good one too all right so um, is, it, is it for mike and lord i'll i'll uh i'll call on him and, and okay fire him. away remember there's no right answer just roll <laughs> okay ballads um first off whitney houston the queen of ballads mike uh background vocals i hate them beach boys Oh, oh, love he's it. Pro. He's a pro. Yeah, he's a pro. I, I, I don't want to get embarrassed here. Uh, Lauren, uh, major or minor keys to sing in? Major or minor to sing in? I love minor keys. Yeah, me Minor. Too. Uh, my biggest influence after me? 
Herb. Herb, yeah, me and Herb, we're a team. I'm going to say my, my mother. Love it. Mm -hmm. Mom. Right answer. Right answer. Hey, I got another one for you. Uh, not for you, but for uh, Lauren. What, what's your favorite key? D. It's my best resonance. B? D. D. Oh, D. Ooh. Mine's F sharp. Um, well, and we all know the D minor is the saddest of all keys, so just throwing it out there. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot about that. Uh, Mike, your favorite instrument? Bass guitar. I mean, that's really what, that's, that's pretty much all I got. <laughs> Can you give me a brand name? Fender. Same here. Uh, Lauren, uh, reverb. Do you like reverb? I do. Okay. What about vibrato? Do you like to use your vibrato a lot? All the time. <laughs> Mike, headphones. Ooh. Uh Sennheiser. Okay. This is this is a this is a, a an interesting one for me. Um what song moves your soul the most? For me it's uh it's um uh, just a closer walk with thee by uh um Patsy Klein. I love Patsy Klein. So what's yours? Hmm. Bridge over troubled water. Oh, wow. Yeah. 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 Better than mine. Mike, how about yours? Um, Change is going to come, Sam Cook. Mm. Herb, how about yours? Uh, G Thing by Dr. Drake. No, I'm just. I'm just <laughs> 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 and, and, and Herb, you probably. You probably cry on that too. Right? Oh no, no I question. Too. I, okay. I get a little guy yeah. called Chameleon, and we sit there and listen to it. And um, I think um, "Sun Goddess" by Earth, Wind, and Fire. Okay, well, you won, Herb. <laughs> yeah. No, er everything was. What was interesting about all those answers is that everybody who named a title, I felt something about mm -hmm. that. And there's a weight. That, there's a weight. Yeah. yeah, it says the power of the songs. I mean, it mm. just just saying the song, saying Whitney, and me thinking about Shoop. You know, I came out of yeah. the, the the home that Babyface came out of in L.A. and just the the sheer brilliance of the simplicity. People understand that it's really hard to be simple. Yeah. Number one, and then to have a vocalist who can interpret that in such a way and take it to the next level. You know who who writes a song called Shoop, and have it be so powerful, so emotive, so you know, or the change is going to come, or bridge over troubled water, and they sit they sit in your head like you heard them yesterday, um, and you and you know what it did to you when you heard it, and and so man, you know what Th this was less an interview, more an affirmation of just how lucky we all are um and, and i would say this um and i'm sure dave feels the same way um we are really blessed to have the people who enjoy coming on pensado's place we're, our, we're in our 14th year 580 wow. some 500 Amazing. some hour episodes that go way back and people are excited to come on our show but what, what they don't know is that dave and i get more out of it than the interview yeah. And when we get to meet old friends like Mike Elizondo, who we've also always admired, and always, then meet, meet this, this force of nature named Lauren Daigle, my mm. goodness. So I don't know who <laughs> had a better time, <laughs> uh, honestly. Uh, well, thank you guys for doing this show. Really, as an avid watcher, listener, um, you guys ask the questions of these creators and, and people that we all want to ask and so thank you for just the passion and the love and joy that you guys put into this show and and uh you know we're the benefit we get to, we get to benefit all of that so thank you for that yeah. well we, we we disagree we get the benefit yeah. <laughs> but that's a good battle that's a there good go. for us to have yeah. um lauren you have made uh, it, it is completely clear why people are lauren nuts uh, mm -hmm. you don't you don't inspire fan loyalty it, it goes way way beyond that um 
it doesn't matter what you say. It's how you touch people, man. It's a, mm-hmm. we're on a Zoom, and I feel like I went to a Lauren concert, and I understand her. Well, I, I don't know what. You probably have to bring in ambulances if I come to a show <laughs> and cart me out afterwards. Uh, uh, oh, I can't wait. We're coming to crypto. Oh, it's yeah. So oh, calm. I'm there. Oh, I'm there. Uh, we will get y'all tickets. I have to. I feel like this was a meeting of friends. I yeah. got to give y'all some bear hugs. Absolutely. You know? yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Bear hugging right back, too. Right. Yes. Um, yes. No, know for a fact that we are here for you and your endeavors. Uh, whatever word we can get out and push and make sure you know, make sure people know. We do a lot of things that are past the Zoom in term past the show, in terms of live events or at NAM or other kinds of stuff. We are blessed with a fairly large platform to go do things. And what we love to do is bring people like yourselves to people who think they'll never meet you. And mm-hmm. it put put it in environments where it goes past what I call the monkey cage, where you just go look at the m- monkeys in the cage and they talk and they leave and you never, we try to go past that into an engagement kind of thing where people walk away touched. Um, yeah, let's do it. So, you know what, we'll stay close to your team. Um, but, you know, I just want to say thank you. Mm-hmm. Just what an inspiring hour. Um, it flew by. That's how we always know. <laughs> so, and, and and I hope you and you guys enjoyed it. Absolutely. Such a blast. Oh, I'm not ready for it to be over. <laughs> I didn't yeah, know that. No, same, here. <laughs> same, same here. Well, I'll, well, here I'll, I'll, I'll jump in. Herb, don't ever get an airplane with her because she loves turbulence when she got some turbulence. Oh, there you go. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> I just got a song I'll about get my it. hands up. I put my hands up like this anytime it's a roller coaster. I'm like, <laughs> oh God. So so while I'm clutching the armrest so that my fingerprints are in the middle, just like <laughs> she's just making money. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's hilarious. Well, well and, and, Lauren, you, a shout out to Batiste. He's 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 a great guy. Yeah. And, mm. and Lauren, you just you just you just came up with something that might be interesting and fun for us to do. Maybe while you're on tour. Maybe we'll do like when you have a moment at a sound check and and we do the interview while you're at a sound check so people can get mm. a little bit of what's going on behind the scenes. Um, and her are, band, her band right now is out of control. Oh, I got to see it. You got to see it, the whole thing. Yeah. yeah. Love players. Um, we got some L.A. guys out there, too. Oh, cool. Courtney Leonard, Sean Horton. Oh, real, 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 so, real. Yeah, those are real. So I can't wait. Or or we can come and do the interview at the sound check. Love it. When you so we'll we'll continue to talk and connect and all that kind of stuff. Um, Could not have been more honored. What a great hour and just the beginning of a long, long, long term romance. Hey, I I would I would I'm gonna go out on on a limb, but I think this is one of the best best shows we got we put on. It absolutely feels that way. Yeah. No question. No question. And, and we got a pretty wow. big sample size. We got a pretty yeah. big sample size. Uh, this was a great one. Uh, yeah. Way beyond. So yeah. um, It took it, us a damn long enough time to get here, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I know like, hey, the, the good stuff is the stuff you have to fight for. Always. That's right. That's right. Every time it is. When we had this many hurdles, I was like, "This is going to be something special." Be great. And, and was, was from the time the lights came on, uh, before we just bore our audience to death because we're so in love with each other, <laughs> we uh, we could not be more honored um, uh, on behalf of Dave and I and the team, um, and to your team for making it happen, and for us finally coming together, and also for your artistic integrity and courage and thoughtfulness and your wide lens view and your incredibly good taste in picking Mike Elizondo, who's just the man. Uh, We are so thrilled to have you. We're going to do a bunch more. And thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you, y'all. This this is like a friendship. I feel it. I'm grateful. I'm so grateful. Thank you for putting up with our crazy schedule and for letting us come and hang with y'all. Love Means it. the world. Love it, love it, love it. All righty. 
We'll talk to you next week. Okay. Until next time. All right. See you soon, Lauren. Bye, guys. Bye, Mike.